Gracias por estar con nosotros. Bienvenidos a este seminario web de Wetland Link International. Mi nombre es Felipe Velasco, dirijo la Fundación Montecito y una reserva natural en el lago de Tota, en Colombia. Formé parte del panel de jueces que tuvieron el placer de ver docenas de solicitudes para los premios Star o Estrella para Centros de Humedales y la dificultad de reducirlas a 23 ganadores. Hoy presentaré solo a cuatro de los ganadores del premio. Todos ellos han sido reconocidos por el trabajo inclusivo y de alta calidad que realizamos para inspirar a las personas a mejorar los humedales. Sus presentaciones incluyen alegría y conocimientos sobre lo que constituye un Star Wetland Center o Centro de Humedales Estrella. Espero que podamos brindarles algunas ideas y animarles a participar en esta iniciativa la próxima vez. Porque, sí, WLI ya se está preparando para la próxima ronda de Wetland Stars. Les contaré más sobre eso al final del seminario web. Para empezar, vayamos muy al noroeste de mí, al centro de los Estados Unidos, donde hay un enorme humedal, vital para las aves playeras migratorias. Make Kansas Wetlands Education Center part of every trip to Cheyenne Bottoms. Wetlands are unique in Kansas, and Cheyenne Bottoms, a 41,000-acre wetland, is the largest marsh on the interior of the United States, designated internationally important for migrating shorebirds and waterfowl. Check out our exhibits explaining what wetlands are and why they are important, the animal and plant communities seen at Cheyenne Bottoms, and dioramas, and hands-on exhibits telling the Cheyenne Bottoms story. The Cope Wetlands exhibit has interactive exhibits, including an augmented reality watershed sandbox, one-of-a-kind wetland floor projections game, kids' activity area, and a bird watching and build a bird station. The center offers a variety of public programs, everything from bird watching workshops to stargazing events and nature craft workshops to drop-in STEM activities. Shop the Wetlands gift store with a variety of nature-themed items, field guides, and bird feeders, Kansas-made items, and children's toys. Make Kansas Wetlands Education Center part of every trip to Cheyenne Bottoms. Welcome to the Kansas Wetlands Education Center. We are so excited that we were awarded the, the Star Wetlands Center Award this last year. We, we just think that it's such an honor to be, to be recognized with so many other wetland centers across the world. We want to show you guys a little bit about what our center is and why it's unique. So let's go check it out. The Coke Wetlands Exhibit Hall is one of the features of the Kansas Wetlands Education Center. Our exhibits here kind of tell the story about what this area is. In all, the exhibits kind of do three functions. They explain what wetlands are and why they're important. They talk about the animals and plants that can be found in this area. And then they tell the Cheyenne Bottom story um, through various exhibits and, and uh, displays. We're sitting here at Cheyenne Bottoms, which is where the Kansas Wetland Center is located. It's in the heart of Kansas, right in the center of Kansas, and it's considered to be the largest marsh on the interior of the United States. And so we have a lot to talk about about why this place is so unique. Um, several exhibits like this show its importance to the central flyway. Um, all the birds that stop here along their migration path and the Cheyenne Bottoms provides them a stopover during that migration. We can talk about how the, the, the birds move through the area and, and when they are stopping here and about why this is a, an important flyway and a byway bringing both humans and animals together. One of the most popular exhibits that we have is our watershed augmented reality sandbox. Um, the idea of this exhibit is to show where the water comes from for Cheyenne Bottoms. For the most part, um, the wetland is supplied by natural runoff from various watersheds in the area. This exhibit shows how people can make their own watershed using the sand as well as the, the software to give us a topography of the sand in the box and then it allows you to show water running off down into the low spots and that is basically how the hydrology works here at Cheyenne Bottoms of uh, creating these these upper areas and the lower areas and having water run down in, and collecting in the, the lower parts. So the 41,000 acre basin is basically supplied by a giant watershed 
and this is a great way of illustrating that to our visitors. One of the main things that our exhibits try to do is to talk about the plant and animal communities that make Cheyenne Bottoms home. We have several exhibits that, that illustrate that very well. We have one that talks about the shorebirds, since that's such a huge component of, of the wetlands here. We try to, to have people learn a little bit about the feeding zones that the wetlands provide for the shorebirds based on their, their, their height and, uh, and where they feed in the, in the different zones of, of the wetland. We also have a Build-A-Bird station. Since birds are such a huge, um, huge component of the wildlife that's here, um, people can take birds and bird bodies and heads and, and legs, and they can make either correct birds or they can make up their own birds um, based on different adaptations that those birds might have uh, using these, these different, different legs and, and bodies and heads. Um, so kind of a fun way of showing the diversity of birds that stop here at Cheyenne Bottoms. So similarly, we can do something similar with plants here as well at Cheyenne Bottoms. Um, there's some interesting plant communities that are very important to the habitat and wildlife of Cheyenne Bottoms. And so um, using, using these um, various plants that we've chosen that are, that are here at Cheyenne Bottoms, they can put them in the zone of the wetland where they live as well. So cattails, uh, an, an emergent plant that's important here. Um, and just like with the birds, we have a build a plant station as well where, where people can choose leaves, roots, and stems and put them together to build various, various types of plants that live here at Cheyenne Bottoms. Well, continuing on with our animals that live here at Cheyenne Bottoms, we like to tell the story of the smallest animals that, that are, are make Cheyenne Bottoms home. And that's our aquatic invertebrates. They're such an important part of the food chain here and uh, what allows so many other animals to thrive here at Cheyenne Bottoms too. Um, some of the best programs that we do are talking about these, these aquatic invertebrates because so many people don't know about them and they've never seen them because of where they live. And so we like to, to illustrate them, show, show a little bit about the unique forms of different, different invertebrates that live at Cheyenne Bottoms and what that means for the health of the wetlands here. We can also talk about the larger animals that inhabit Cheyenne Bottoms. And so we have panels talking about the mammals, reptiles, turtles, and amphibians that, that call Cheyenne Bottoms home. And along with those, there's little um, viewing panels that go through and show the different animals that live here at Cheyenne Bottoms and give some interesting facts about them. Um, along with this, we have a nice interactive frog call box where visitors can press buttons and listen to some of the frog courses that go on here at Cheyenne Bottoms. We found out a long time ago that um, having live animals is such an important tool that we can use in our educational programs. And so our classroom is full of about 25 to 30 different species of live animals, pretty much all that can be found right around this area. And we use most of these for our programming and um, people tend to really like critters in general. And so being able to see the live animals uh, in person is a, is a great way of, of teaching about these incredible animals that are here at Cheyenne Bottoms. The mission of the Kansas Wetlands Education Center is to educate the public about wetland communities, their importance, and the need for conservation and restoration with emphasis on Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivira National Wildlife Refuge. KWEC welcomes 8,000 drop-in visitors each year to enjoy our exhibits, classroom animals, and 16-minute video about Cheyenne Bottoms. Our educators provide programming for over 15,000 contacts each year through 700 educational programs. One of our largest initiatives is the opportunity to share about Cheyenne Bottoms with all of the second grade students in our county each fall. Students rotate through stations on the water cycle, night creatures of Cheyenne Bottoms, a nature hike, and more. Likewise, our most popular program each year is a butterfly festival. As the monarch butterfly migrates south to Mexico in the fall, it can be found nectaring or roosting at the center. Annually, hundreds of visitors visit the center use nets to capture the monarchs, and place tags on their wings that help scientists monitor the populations, habitats, and conditions the butterflies may encounter on their journey. Other popular programs utilize our classroom ambassador animals, allow students to wear waders, 
and get into the marsh in search of aquatic invertebrates they identify, and dissect owl pellets. We travel to classrooms and organizations within 70 miles of our center, offering programs at no charge, or groups can travel to our center for field trips. Camps for a variety of age groups are popular each summer. Nature crafts are off offered often. We plan a variety of public programs around events like Earth Day, the Perseid Meteor Shower, and love to provide hands-on opportunities for families. Check out our website at wetlandcenter.fhsu.edu to learn more about our programs, watch online presentations, and take a virtual tour of Cheyenne Bottoms. The tour includes drone footage, 360-degree videos, interviews with key stakeholders, interactive games, and allows you to feel as though you are in our wetland. Another project we encourage people to check out is a 32-page fully illustrated children's story about a migrating American avocet, the bird on the logo for the Kansas Wetlands Education Center. It is beautifully illustrated and tells the story of shorebirds, importance of wetlands, and highlights Cheyenne Bottoms. We hope you enjoyed learning about our Star Wetland Center. Lo hicimos. Gracias, Mandy Kern, del Centro Educativo de Humedales de Kansas. Y gracias a todos los que están viendo en vivo hoy. Si estás viendo en vivo, no dudes en utilizar el botón de preguntas y respuestas para enviar comentarios o preguntas. A continuación, nos encontramos con Lisa Chu, muy conocida en la red WLI Asia Oceanía. Hello, my name is Lisa Cho from Gundu Nature Park. First off, I would like to say it's been a true honor for Gundu to be considered for the Star Wetland Center Award. Now is a 10 minute quick look at Gundu Nature Park. So Gundu is located in Taiwan, which is an important part of the East Australian Flyway. And Gundu has been recognized by BirdLife International as an important bird area or IBA. So here's Taiwan, and Guangdu is located in Taipei City, so it's in the northern part of Taiwan. And birds come into Taiwan will hit the coastal regions, follow along the coastal areas, and some will hit inland along the Damsui River, and they will come to the Guangdu Plain. And Guangdu Nature Park is located in the corner of the Guangdu Plain. As you can see, um, the nearby surrounding area is heavily populated, and we're like the only green patch where birds can stay. So here's an aerial view of the surrounding area. We have mountains to our northern um, north and east corner, blocking the northeasterly winds. Guandu Plain is the largest stretch of rice paddy fields remaining in the Taipei region. Here's the park down here. Um, the Guandu Nature Reserve is outside. We're really lucky because we are at the conjunction of two major tributaries, the Keelong River and the Daimser River. So bringing in nutrients from upstream as long as, as well as from the ocean. So bringing a lot of nutrients, um, enriching the biodiversity and the different habitats here. So, Here's uh, a quick look at how Gwendu came about. Um, Gwendu came about with a bunch of um, bird enthusiastic, enthusiasts um, who loved birds and who cared about birds, who eventually formed the Wild Bird Society of Taipei, which is a non-profit organization aimed at promoting um, the protection of wild birds and their habitats. It began in 1973 and we're celebrating 50 years this year. So we operate under the motto today birds to um, tomorrow people as their good indicators for the environment. So um, Gwendu came about um, in the 1970s and 80s when birders in um, Northern Taipei began to notice a huge decline of birds in the area and birders in um, during those periods would always come to Guangdu on on the weekends to do a lot of birding and so they began to lobby for the formation of a protected area and about two decades later they were able to convince the government to purchase 57 hectares for the land for the park and in 2001 when the park opened um 
the Wildbird Society of Taipei or WBST receive management rights to the park and we've been managing the park for over 20 years now. So we operate under the four key main objectives, um, conservation, education, leisure, and research. So all conservation efforts into maintaining the wetland habitat and its habitants allow us to create a rich, diverse education program um, that target different audiences and provides a good leisure um, place for people to come and enjoy nature. And this is all possible through um, a long-term monitoring, which feeds back into how we manage our um, environment. So first off, I would like to talk a little bit about our research management um, and habitat management. So we have four management areas within Gwendu Nature Park. Um, the main visitor area is around seven hectares is where um, visitors can go when they come into the park. Um, it has the highest level of disturbance. Um, the sustainable management area off to the side is around 11 hectares. It's a restricted area, so visitors can only enter if they're in a group activity or they, if they're going down there for a specialized program. And the remaining area is our core reserve area where we reserve the largest stretch of um, habitat for our wildlife. And it, all, the only people that can do down there are our staff, our volunteers who are helping with the monitor, and some of the workers for our habitat construction work. So um, we've been monitoring the area within Guandu ever since 1998. Um, we do it 18 times a year, recording species numbers and the habitats they occur in. And here's the results. As you can see, when the park opened in 2001, the numbers were low for the birds. And as um, we started recreating um, our water bodies, and doing a lot of habitat work, the bird numbers increased dramatically. However, when we stop, since we only have 57 hectares that we can work with, and there's only so much we can do, um, the bird numbers began to decline again. So in 2016, we began to combine some of our smaller water bodies into larger ones. And you can see an increase in the bird numbers again. And also in that same year, we started reintroduction, in reintroduction um, brackish water into our wetland. So that has helped with our birds dramatically. So managing wetlands at Guandu, we've been continuously discussing how we can do it better. Um, if you think about succession in a wetland, it goes from water, uh, open water, slowly build up of plants and organic matter and sedimentation. Slowly, it will reach a later stage, becoming a grassland or a even a forested area. But what we want is to um, keep it in the early stages. So one of the ways we've been exploring how to do this is using a tractor in the same manner how we would manage a rice paddy field. So keeping the wetlands in the early stages of aquatic succession will keep it in a healthy and a biodiverse environment. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we do a lot of various projects in terms of habitat management. And one of them is um, the introduction of our water buffaloes. We have six now. They help us eat aquatic vegetation, then wallow in the mud, um, helping us maintain um, good waterways. And um, the other project, which started in um, 2016 is the Brackish Water Reintroduction Project. So we've been monitoring our benthic population and seeing that there's a huge decline in the benthic population over the years because of our habitat work and the fact that our water is largely um, fresh water. So by opening us up the sluice gates and letting brackish water come in, um, we were able to see a increase in our um, benthic population, which then led to an increase in our um, bird population. So um, other than that, we also do a lot of habitat creation through creation of these floating 
platforms for birds to use so they can rest on their um, black winged stilts will nest on these sites as well. So our um, that our environment is very diverse, so is our wildlife. And because of that, we can create a diverse education program based on it. So um, we have a really strong outdoor education program, which is available for elementary, middle school to high school groups. We also have programs that fit with the Taiwan government requirements for environmental education certification. We also produce a lot of educational materials and for example, with the help of Wealthy Asia Fund last year, we were able to create this preschool programming for um, preschool groups that come into the park. So in terms of programs, we do a lot of um, outdoor education, um, looking at aquatic insects, going down to the wetland. We also have a uh, project wet program. We invite guests to um, perform um, talks. Um, some of our new programs that we started this year, the beetle investigation team, because um, we have a lot of staghorn beetles in the park. So we want to um, allow visitors coming in to learn about different um, insect survey techniques. So pitfall traps using nets, and we also incorporated paper organic into the program. Um, our summer camp, we focus on different topics each year. Our education team is really good at coming up with new programming every year. This year, they did a program with a focus on invasive species. So participants were able to go down and remove this invasive plant species and take the material back into the classrooms and use it to make a dye with it, uh, a botanical dye. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we also have a very good program, um, planting rice, um, experiencing the seasons. Come in, plant the rice in the spring, um, do some weeding in the summer, and then harvest in the fall. And then in the winter, they learn about the different products you can make with rice. And this is a uh, um, rice um, art that they made um, in the past. We also do programs outside of the park, for example, taking um, pe people to see Gwendu Temple, which is nearby, to the mangroves outside. We go on bike rides. We even go up to the nearby mountains to learn about um, environmentally friendly farming practices. Our huge, um, we have two huge events normally happening at the end of the year. One is called the Gwendu International Nature Art Festival. Um, it began in 2006 and every year we focus on a different theme. This year our theme was Nature a Gift. Um, for, for more information you can go on our website. Um, this is one of our artists with her artwork. So we invite artists from all over the world to focus on the theme and build a art piece based on na na uh, natural materials. The other is the Taipei International Bird Watching Fair. And this year's theme is Endemic Birds of Formosa or Taiwan. It'll be held in October. Um, as we will be celebrating 50 years, the celebration will be bigger. And we'll be inviting some of our friends from well the Wally Asia Oceania Network. So Guandu is really important because we make wetlands available for the public. And this is our main visitor area where most um, of our activities occur. Our nature center is structured in the middle. Um, we have bird hides throughout and burl walks and walkways. So Guandu is really accessible. Uh, we're like 10, uh, we're 40 minutes from the main city. Um, once you get to Guandu Nature, uh, Guandu MRT station, um, you can either take a bus, walk, or ride the U-bike, which is a ride-share bike system, and you can just get to the park relatively quickly. Um, we now have automated ticket booths to our entrance and for our parking, so it makes things a lot easier to get in. Um, 
uh, outdoor signs and displays have both Mandarin and English. Now we even have a QR codes for sign language interpretation, and there's a link to our audio guide as well. So as I mentioned, our audio guide, um, information is available in Mandarin, English, and Japanese, same with our pamphlets that are available. Our um, facilities in the main visitor area are largely accessible by strollers and wheelchairs. So you can see ramps outside our bird hides, uh, along our walkways. Our nature center has gone under a major renovation as we've been using it for over 20 years now. Um, so it focuses on, um, there's two floors. On the first floor, there's a My Nature, um, wondering, um, observing the wonders of nature. And my personal favorite is a little section on um, shorebird bill morphology and how that impacts what they eat. And, there's a section on protecting the future. On the second floor, overlooking the wetland, you have uh, spotting scopes, uh, and there's now a CCTV, so you can get a closer look at the wetland. Our nature center offers a lot of various services. There's free Wi-Fi, there's a breastfeeding room, water dispensers, you can borrow wheelchairs and strollers, our washroom is accessible and gender neutral. There's also a Muslim friendly facilities. We also have a gift shop and a cafe. So all of this that we do at Guangdu can't be done with all our volunteers. They help us with our various tours. They help tell stories to children. Um, they help us maintain the wetlands, um, help um, do monitoring and lead a lot of our programming. So we can't do um, all the work within Guangdu without our dedicated volunteers. And we also have a lot of um, help from our corporate sponsors and our students. Um, they come in and also help maintain the wetland and sponsorships, fosters awareness and then understanding and sustainability. And on that note, thank you for your time. And if you would like to learn more about Guangdu Nature Park, you can follow us on Facebook and our website. Thank you again. Gracias, Lisa. Ahora vamos a Europa, a un centro de visitantes en las afueras de una ciudad, donde la comunidad participa de muchas maneras. So, I'll give you a short short overview of uh, our visitor center in the south of Sweden. It's called Naturum Vattenriket and uh, it's a place in um, close to the city of Kristianstad, as I said, in the south of Sweden. And we are a very proud Star Wetland Center um, and I've been working with this ever since I was um, educated at the Stockholm University. I started off my work in 1989 building up the wetland um, the work with the wetlands together with um, people that are no, no longer working now. And since 2010, the center has been in action. And we will actually start this presentation with a view from above. I hope you can see the film now with the wetland center in the middle of the wetlands along the Helge or river close to the city of Kristianstad. And as you see, the water level changes during the season from the low level with the green grass in the summer to the high water level in the winter. And as I said, our work started off very early and the visitor center came in quite late, uh, only more than 10 years ago. But we started in 1989 to, to work with the wetland area, the Ramsar site um, and the catchment area. We started off because the wetlands were under threat and we wanted to change people's attitudes regarding the water and the wetlands. So we started off building um, visitor sites where people could actually explore the area with uh, dry feet. Um, the area is very, very rich in biodiversity, um, actually one of the most rich areas in Sweden. Uh, due to that, we have so many different habitats there. And we have the city and um, everything is so well connected. 
Anyway, we started off by building this visitor site and uh, eventually in 2005, we were able to create a biosphere reserve, which is a UNESCO designation where the biosphere reserves on the planet, they are about, we're about 700. We all work with the goal to conserve landscape, nature, species, but to work together with people in the area and also to have a strong look logistic support with people. And that's why we uh, eventually, um, finally, were able to build the wetland centre that we had been waiting for so many years. We had wanted to build a wetland centre even ever since 1989. But eventually, in 2010, the Natur and Visitor Centre was put in place in the middle of the wetlands, in the heart of the wetlands, but also very close to the city. Uh, now we have about 100,000 visitors every year to this beautiful place. It's free of entrance, no entrance fee, and um, people from from their close area, but also many vi visiting tourists from other countries. Uh, I am the manager of the place, and I have six staff, uh, four guides, uh, and uh, two people working with technology and administration. And I wanted to tell you uh, some lessons we have learned um, during all these years. And I want to start with the change in attitudes that we uh, find so very important. Because when we started off in 1989, people did not regard the, wet the wetlands or the water as something useful for the area. On the other hand, it was a curse. So people even put the city dump uh, in the middle of the wetlands, very close to the visitor centre uh, in the 1960s. So we started off trying to change um, the attitudes and actually the Swedish name of our visitor centre and the biosphere reserve is Vattenrike, and that means in Swedish, rich in water. And also it means a water kingdom. So by this word, which is now very well known, we started to show that it's not thick of water, it's not waterlogged, it's rich in water. So from this curse uh, with a city dump and uh, people not regarding it as anything valuable, we now have the visitor centre, we have 100,000 visitors and people come to explore the wetlands. So we think we have actually been able to, to change the attitudes and we use these tools to work with other landscape types. We don't always work with wetlands, we work with the sandy, dry grasslands, and we can use the same, same tools. Another lesson that we want to spread is to, um, when you communicate, we think the most powerful message for the public is the love message based on uh, wonder and joy. Uh, if you use negative messages too often, we think that the communication will fall on deaf ears. And that is why we always try to focus on the love perspective. And that means we try to um, take children and adults, everyone out, out in the nature to give them first-hand experiences and create strong links between our visitors and the nature. Because we believe that people that go outdoors and enjoy nature as a child, they tend to be more environmentally responsive as adults. People will protect nature, not because they have to, but because they want to. So that is uh, for us a strong guideline in everything we do, the love uh, perspective. And of course, that means we try very hard to focus on the young. Um, we meet so many school children every year. Uh, we meet teachers, we meet uh, children from preschool up to university, but we also host a biosphere camp uh, in the summer because we are a biosphere reserve. We have this biosphere camp where the children on the picture enjoy nature, meet people uh, who benefit from nature, artists, um, people uh, working with agriculture, painters, uh, musicians. Um, as well as they experience nature. So for us, the focus on the young is very, very strong. But not only the young, uh, we try to focus on, on, we want everyone to be able to enjoy the wetlands, 
uh, and the visitor side. And that is why we, when we can, uh, try to build boardwalks as this one or the picture, which, which is just outside the visitor center. Boardwalks that are good for people with buggies or people in a wheelchair and, um, and also make people stay on the path. Um, so you can look at the, the valuable areas without damaging them. But also we try to make accessibility better by um, doing lots of audio guides where you can scan a QR code uh, out in the landscape and hear us tell about nature, culture, um, fun things about uh, the place you visit. Also, of course, the, the web page is important in this and also the, uh, the, the uh, displays we have in the outdoor museums to keep text simple, uh, to use simple words. And actually one person in our staff is a journalist and that is to make text much more easy to read for people. So the activities we uh, host at Natur and Visitor Centre have a very wide range. Um, and that is actually connected with how we uh, want to change the attitudes. Because we think uh, by offering a wide range of activities, we also uh, connect to a wide range of people. I think that it is, um, you need different keys, so to speak, to the lock of every heart. For some people, it is uh, joining us one late night on a bat safari to see the bat hunting outside Naturum. But for other people, it is listening to the water music played by our local symphony orchestra um, on the national day. So we try to combine activities, uh, including literature, music, poetry, as well as traditional field activities. And we hope there is something for everyone at our visitor center. As with the activities, uh, I think uh, it is important to also have a very broad communication and to understand that some people want to read things on a web page or on social media. Others still want a map in their hand or a folder or a brochure. So we try to um, also have a very broad communication. And uh, if you want to know more about our area, I enc encourage you to follow us on Facebook or or Instagram or, or um, LinkedIn. Um, for us as a biosphere reserve, the local involvement is one key uh, factor for us to work with. And we try that in different ways. Um, one very successful example is that we educate ambassadors for the biosphere every year, and we now have more than 300. And these are normal people, people, so to speak. They could be hairdressers or they could be teachers or they, uh, they um, grow carrots and they just want to come and learn more about the biosphere. And the only thing we ask them to do is to spread the message. And also in the springtime, we have uh, bird guides or actually crane guides, because that is when the uh, big bird, the, Euro the European crane, come to our wetlands to feed and dance. And so many people come and to see these uh, beautiful birds. And on, on the picture, you can see one of the crane guides guiding a group of Ukraine uh, migrants that came to us um, uh, the early spring in 2022, of course. And we, uh, as soon as we could, uh, uh, transport them with a bus to the cranes to make them experience these beautiful birds to to think of something else for for an hour or two so we have the ambassadors we have the crane guides and we also have uh, the friends of Vattenriket um, that support us least last but not least uh, the economy um, and I think this is quite important to show um, also that even if we don't have any entrance fee to our visitor center Naturum, several studies have shown that we make a great impact to the local economy. And that is because all the people that come to our area because of the visitor center and because of the work we do in the biosphere reserve and with the visitor sites. So actually researchers have shown several times that the spending of the visitors that 
without Naturum and the work uh, with the biosphere, they would not have come to the area. Their spending is 3.2 million euros every year. And that is about three times the cost, the total cost for the visitor center and all the work we do in the biosphere. So that is uh, quite, quite an impact and um, shows that nature tourism is very important at that the work we all do at the, our visitor centers is so important, not only uh, for the changing of attitudes, but also for making people come to the area. So with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation by saying that uh, our goal is to make uh, people love the Vattenriket area and uh, do things that benefit both people and nature. And I so much want to uh, have uh, visits from, from those of you who uh, pass Scandinavia. Please uh, just give me a, a call or a send me an email and uh, I would be so happy to meet you at our visitor center. Thank you. De la misma manera, Karin, sé que me encantaría visitarte en Baten Riquet e ir a Danapure, al Centro Educativo de Humedales de Kansas y al Parque Natural Guandú. Nuestro final es realmente un placer. Aquí en Colombia hay un humedal llamado Danapure, que está dentro del terreno de una escuela. Así que vamos con el personal y los alumnos del Liceo Taller San Miguel. It was a very, very pleasant surprise to receive the Star Wetland Center Award. Receiving this award means motivation for us as an institution to continue working with our students to protect the environment and to work in education. It motivates us and tells us that it's worth it to have these everyday efforts with our students and that they are recognized and valued. Every day, every time that they come to this beautiful place, they uh, learn about it and they recognize its value in their lives and for our planet. Hola, les quiero compartir una frase de la escritora Anna Kulik Lachner. Los humedales son oasis en el desierto, milagros terracuáticos, tangibles o intangibles, grandes o pequeños. Increíbles o increíbles, sedienta de humedades. Danapure es un lugar feliz y así lo sentimos nosotros, porque var venimos varias horas a la semana y queremos estar más tiempo. Recibimos de las autoridades ambientales un diploma muy importante, porque para ellos somos verdaderos in investigadores de humedales. De Danapure me gusta la profe Estelita y todo lo que veo en él. Para todos en el colegio fue una gran sorpresa la noticia de que el humedal de Anapure ganó el premio Star Wetland y eso nos hizo pensar de que estamos trabajando bien para conservar este paraíso. En el humedal de Anapur de nuestro colegio hemos estado observando diferentes especies como el oso perezoso, el mono aullador, los guatines y cangrejos. Más adelante esperamos tener un mejor inventario de animales. Formar parte de los humedales estelares ha sido gran entusiasmo para nosotros, debido a que hablamos de proyectos de gran importancia como humedales marinos, incursionando el tema de los océanos. También hablamos de proyectos como salvando ranas, que fueron unas ranas que encontramos, salvamos y las libramos en el humedal, de las cuales todavía seguimos. Otro proyecto de gran importancia para nosotros ha sido mensajes ocultos en los líquenes. El objetivo de este proyecto ha sido intentar descifrar los códigos que nos deja la naturaleza en los líquenes. Poco a poco hemos estado trabajando para convertirlos en obras de arte. El humedal va creciendo en sus alrededores. Ya tenemos un sendero que mide cerca de un kilómetro. En medio de bosques, guaduales y las dos quebradas que rodean el colegio. Venimos vigilando algunos nidos de aves y hemos podido ver que ellas están siempre cuidando sus huevos. Esto nos avisa que han llegado nuevos pajaritos para llenar de vida el humedal.
Hemos tenido muchas lluvias por dos años y esto nunca había sucedido. Hemos visto que gran parte de las flores y con ellas las mariposas han desaparecido. Recuperaremos los jardines con las mariposas que son hermosas y nos hacen mucha falta. Son muchos los sueños que estamos cumpliendo gracias a la confianza que tenemos en Tanapure, que es nuestro centro de investigación. Y seguramente será para ustedes un orgullo porque siempre estaremos construyendo proyectos interesantes. Para el Liceo Taller San Miguel siempre ha sido motivo de orgullo tener un lugar como Danapure, un laboratorio vivo de investigación tan cerca a sus aulas de estudio. Un lugar que estuvo inutilizado y ahora lo convirtieron no solo en un centro de investigación, sino que lo disfrutan en diferentes actividades culturales, ambientales y se ve reflejado en los diferentes proyectos que se han formulado que ya muy pronto eh, estaremos compartiendo con ustedes. Para nosotros mmm, la educación ambiental desde la primera infancia es tan importante como para poder comprobar que estudiantes que ayudaron en la recuperación del humedal ahora como profesionales formaron un grupo de investigación de egresados y son quienes nos envían parte de los proyectos y de las investigaciones que estamos desarrollando. Agradecemos la confianza, todo el amor y la paciencia que nos han tenido en la Red Mundial de los Humedales, porque gracias a ellos estamos en este momento contándoles nuestro orgullo y estamos haciendo que el compromiso sea cada día más grande. ¡Qué alegría! Gracias Luz Estela Tisnes. Ahora estamos en los últimos cinco minutos de nuestro seminario web en vivo. Les recordamos que tenemos un botón de preguntas y respuestas donde pueden hacer preguntas o presentarse. Antes de leer esas preguntas, tengo una actualización sobre los premios STAR o premios WLI a los Centros de Humedales Estrella. WLI, Wetland Link International, organizará otra ronda de premios STAR. Dejo mi cargo de juez y en mi lugar, algunos de los ganadores de 2022 compartirán su experiencia. Dentro de una semana se reunirá el nuevo panel de jueces, perfeccionarán los procesos y luego, es probable, volverán a abrir las aplicaciones en 2024. El objetivo es celebrar una ceremonia de premiación en la próxima COP sobre humedales que tendrá lugar en Zimbabue en 2025. Así que, si les inspira lo que han visto hoy, piensen en participar la próxima vez para conseguir una bonita placa. Con esto voy a concluir este seminario web. Connor colocará las grabaciones en el canal de YouTube de WLI para que puedan compartirlas con sus colegas. Gracias nuevamente Lisa, Mandy y Curtis, Luz Estela y Karin por sus presentaciones como Centros de Humedales Estar. Y gracias a ustedes también por haber estado aquí y por favor manténganse en contacto.